Thank you. Let me begin by factoring some numbers. Factorization, integer factorization, is actually very easy. Here's a bunch of numbers, which I'm going to factor for you very, very quickly. Using civic, the sim of Eratosthenes, I've written down, there are several columns here, and the leftmost column is the integers from 1 through 20. Then the next column is marking a 2 for the integers that are divisible by 2. I actually went further. Often people use the sim of Eratosthenes just to see the numbers that fail to be factored. You can see farther down that 11, 13, 17, and 19 are not divisible by 2 or by 3, 5, and 7, which I used here. Uh, but I've gone further, and I have another column with another 2 for the integers that are divisible by 4, and then another 2 for the integers divisible by 8, and I stopped with 16 for obvious reasons. Continued on to the integers divisible by 3, and you can see that I've completely factored, aside from those annoying little 11, 13, 17, and 19, I've completely factored all these numbers with a very small amount of effort, just drawing 2, 3, 5, and 7 as divisors. Of course, this doesn't scale up very well, but you can keep going for a while. Uh, the, the notion that the only numbers that won't be factored by 2, 3, 5, and 7, uh, the notion that the, the only failures of that are primes, does eventually break down. Let me move on to, for, for instance, the, the addition here, the table on the right is now integers, 20 integers starting from 6, 12, instead of uh, 1 through 20, I've got 6, 11 plus 1 through 20. And then I mark the ones there that are divisible by 2, and powers of 2, and 3, and powers of 3, and so on. And you can see that I, again, successfully factored, completely factored some numbers, like 625 is divisible by 5, and another 5, and another 5, and another 5, and hey, it's equal to 5 to the 4th. On the other hand, there are lots of numbers here that were not completely factored into 2s and 3s. Some of them, if you see enough 2s and 3s, like 624 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, <coughs> times, however many 2s it is, times 3, and then times something else, which, if you think for a moment, has to be prime. On the other hand, there's also numbers here that weren't factored at all, and they're so big that you can't be sure whether they're prime or not. <coughs> If you try factoring 611 with 2, 3, 5, and 7, if you check is it divisible by 2, 3, 5, and 7, you see it isn't like a lot of the numbers listed here, but it's not actually a problem. If you want to discover its factors, here's a rather insane looking way to do it, starting from all of these numbers that I have succeeded in factoring. If you compare the left and right tables, then you see that for some numbers, I've completely factored both i and 611 plus i. It's not a surprise for i to be completely factored. There were only four i's where that didn't work. But 611 plus i, that takes a lot more work to be completely factored into 2, 3, 5, and 7. You can see it happened once within the tables that I've written down. 625 is 5 to the 4th, and 14 on the left of 625 was completely factored into 3 times 7. So that's a good example. 14 times 625 is some product of powers of 2, 3, 5, and 7. I kept going with the tables for about 100 numbers and found that 64 times 675, that also was completely factored. 64 is, of course, a power of 2, and 675, if you divide out some 5s, 3s, whatever, then you find the factorization of 675. And similarly, 75 times 611 plus 75 is completely factored into 2, 3, 5, and 7. Multiplying together those equations, interestingly, I end up with a square. 14 times 625 times 6, uh, 64 times 675 times 75 times 686 works out to be a square. You can just add up the exponents of 2, 3, 5, and 7 and see that if you add up 2 to the 1, 2 to the 6, 2 to the 1, you add up 1, 6, and 1, you find 8, which is even. And similarly, the exponents of 3, 5, and 7 are even. So this product of i times n plus i for those three values of i, where n is 611, that product is a square. To determine a factor of 611, which I said this computation lets me do, I subtract off the square root of that square I just wrote down from the product of the i's, the 14, 64, and 75. If you like, that's the square root of the product of i squared versus the square root of the product of i times n plus i. And the difference there, amazingly enough, has a factor in common with 611, non-trivial factor, namely 47. Dividing that out, you see 611 is 47 times 13. Both of those clearly are prime. So this might look like the world's stupidest way to factor the number 611. Uh, it might also look like uh, there was no guarantee at the beginning that it worked, and it seems kind of non-systematic. One of the questions you might ask about this procedure was, 
Is there any reason that this should have worked, that multiplying together some numbers in some way and forming a square, that uh, taking some difference of square roots and taking a GCD with 611 should have factored 611? And well, since I did a lot of computations thinking about what examples I wanted to do in this talk, I could easily have selected some big random computation, which at the end of the day gave me some number. And I took the GCD with 611 and came up with a 47. You figure any random number has a 1 in 47 chance of giving a GCD of 47 and 611, almost a 1 in 47 chance, an even bigger chance of giving a 13. But that's not what happened here. As you heard this morning, one of the most important things you learned in previous talks is that s squared minus t squared is s minus t times s plus t. And in particular, if s is the product 14 times 64 times 75, the product of the i's, and if t is the square root of the product of i times n plus i, then s squared minus t squared is a multiple of n. Again, s is a product of i's, and t is a product of, uh, sorry, s squared is a product of i squared, so let me phrase it that way, and t squared is a product of i times n plus i, which is the same as i squared mod n, so the difference is a multiple of n. That means each prime divisor of n divides s squared minus t squared, which is s minus t times s plus t, so each prime divisor of n divides s minus t or s plus t. Can't divide both because looking at t, uh, if you had a prime divisor of s minus t and s plus t, then it would have to divide 2t. And well, we know that 2, 3, 5, and 7 are not divided, which is 6, 11. So every prime dividing n divides either s minus t or s plus t. And given that information, suddenly it's not so surprising, although as the slide says, there's no advanced guarantee. But it's unsurprising. You might guess that half the time, one of the prime divisors of n, assuming it has 2, which it did in this case, one of the prime divisors of n decides that it's going to divide s minus t and the other one decides that it's going to divide s plus t, in which case taking the GCD of s minus t with n gives that one prime that divides s minus t. Another question you might ask about this procedure is, well, I wrote down three values of i, i times n plus i being completely factored into products of powers of 2, 3, 5, and 7, and then multiply them together to make a square product. And well, as the slide asks, was it just blind luck? And the answer to this question is yes, it was blind luck that three completely factored numbers got multiplied together to form a square. The exponent vectors of those numbers happened to add up to even, comma, even, comma, even, comma, even. But you can do without that. You can apply exactly the same method to the extent that this is a systematic method. Uh, to any number n and say, well, okay, whatever completely factored numbers I come up with at the end, I'm going to look for a subset, a non-empty subset of those numbers, whose product is a square. And that's something easy to do. That's something you can quickly do given a bunch of vectors, let's say more vectors than the length of each vector. Given a bunch of vectors, you can very quickly find a non-empty subsequence of them whose sum is 0, mod 2, sum is even. Because that's just finding a linear dependency between the vectors, finding an element of the kernel of the matrix that those vectors form. This is linear algebra, even easier than normal linear algebra. It's linear algebra mod 2. So all the computations are very easy. It's guaranteed to work if you have more vectors, again, than the length of each vector, which is maybe more than you need, but certainly that's sufficient. For example, I tried doing a similar computation for n equals 671, and I found some completely factored i times n plus i's, as are listed there. And in this case, multiplying the first few together did not conveniently give me a square. But looking at the exponent matrix, I'm looking at the matrix of 2, 3, 5, and 7s, where the exponents are 5, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 3, 4, 2, 1, 2, and 6, 1, 1, 2. Putting those together, well, that's a matrix, five vectors of length 4, which have to have a linear dependency, mod 2. I calculated the kernel of the matrix, the null space of the matrix, and came up with it's generated by 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, the positions there of the ones are the positions in these five numbers of uh, numbers that you can multiply together to form a square. For instance, if you take the 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, that says take the first and third and fourth numbers, the 1 times n plus 1, 15 times n plus 15, and 49 times n plus 49. Multiply those together, and that forms a square, which incidentally does not succeed in factoring this number. But if you keep going for a little while, then you do succeed in factoring 671. All right, this, again, might seem like the world's stupidest method to factor 
integers. And it is a very, very bad way to factor, for instance, 671. I'm sure that all of you looking at 671 said, aha, I see the factorization of 671 without having to think at all. This is not a good method of factoring small numbers compared to all the other better methods we have. But it scales really, really well. Here's what it looks like for bigger numbers. We believe this method will work for arbitrary numbers as well. It won't factor primes, but it will succeed in factoring arbitrary positive integers into power of 2 times power of uh, whatever odd primes show up. So it can separate any odd primes the same way that it separated 13 from 47. <coughs> Did you find that again? Sorry, in the front row, I'm just being a bit distracted. Thanks. Um, in general, if you have a number n you're trying to factor and a uh, parameter y for this algorithm, I'll choose y a little bit later, tell you all about how big y has to be, then you look at the integers i between 1 and y squared, write down i times n plus i for each of those uh, integers i. These i times n plus i, in general, I'll call congruences, alluding to the fact that i is congruent to n plus i modulo n. And then with the fully factored congruences, the, the smooth numbers, I'll get to the smoothness terminology, the numbers i times n plus i that are products of powers of 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on up through y, uh, you try to find a subset of those, non-empty subset, whose product is a square. Incidentally, if you left out step one here, you just said, OK, I'm going to look through a bunch of numbers to find a square product. If one of those numbers has a really big prime dividing it, you're probably not going to see that prime again. So it makes sense to throw away the numbers that don't factor into small primes. All the numbers that participate in a product, almost certainly, are going to factor as products of powers of small primes. Having found a square, you then do exactly the same GCD computation that I did for 611. You take the greatest common divisor of 611 with s minus t, where s is the product of the i's, and t is the square root of the product of i times n plus i. As before, s squared is congruent to t squared mod n, because the product of i squared is congruent to the product of i times n plus i mod n. All right, how big should this parameter y be? I said that this algorithm scales really well. It's really bad for 611, 671. It's not a very good way to factor small numbers compared to the other algorithms we have. More obvious, it's even slower than trial division for factoring small numbers. But as n grows, y actually grows fairly slowly. And I want to convince you of that in some detail. Let's assume let's be pessimists, and let's assume that this algorithm is going to need as many fully factored congruences, i times n plus i, as the number of primes, the number of primes less than or equal to y. Certainly, if it has that many, well, one more than the number of primes, then there's guaranteed to be a square by linear algebra. All right, the length of these vectors, the number of primes less than or equal to y, is about y over log y, prime number theorem. So the question here of whether this algorithm will succeed is the question of whether out of y squared numbers, i times n plus i, for i running from 1 through y squared, out of those y squared congruences, will there be more than y over log y, or to be more precise, more than the number of primes up to y, completely factored congruences? The standard word that people use for this is smoothness. A number completely factored into primes less than or equal to y is called y smooth. And the question of whether this algorithm succeeds, whether there are more than y over log y completely factored congruences out of y squared, that's a question of does each congruence have more than a, what is it, 1 over y log y chance of being y smooth. For instance, let me take y being n to the 1 tenth. Everything that's happening in the algorithm, the cost of the q sieve, is some polynomial in y, depending on exactly what cost measure you use. It's going to be, say, y squared or y cubed operations to do the various steps in the q sieve. So taking y to be n to the 1 tenth, that's a whole lot smaller than n. And if we only have to take, say, y squared, y cubed operations to finish the algorithm, that's only n to the 2 tenths, n to the 3 tenths. That scales a lot better than trial division. If you divided n by all the primes up through square root of n, then that would take you square root of n divisions. And that's a lot more than, say, n to the 2 tenths, n to the 3 tenths. I'm going to convince you that when y is n to the 1 tenth, if n is big enough, and actually not ridiculously big, then the q sieve will succeed in factoring n. 
the first step in seeing this is to think about integers between 1 and y squared. Think about the integers i. What's the chance that i is smooth? If you choose i as a uniform random integer, uniform means every possibility has the same chance. So 1 over y squared chance of choosing 1 or 2 or 3 or 4, all the way up to y squared. What's the chance that that is y smooth? And I claim that's about 30% which some of you might recognize as 1 minus log 2. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, so why is it a, a constant percentage? Well, if you think for a moment about the number of integers up through y, and then take two of those integers, well, there's y squared possibilities, and maybe ordering uh, gives you each product twice. But there's about y squared products of integers up through y. OK, that's a little too optimistic. You can find a product, an integer up through y squared, can be written as a product of integers less than or equal to y in perhaps many more than one way, many more than two ways if you allow your two integers to be flipped. But it seems kind of plausible that if you take all the different numbers up through y and multiply them by all the other different numbers up through y and then throw away the uh, accidental collisions between the results, you should get some fraction of y squared number. And that, that's actually true. It's about 30% of y squared. In fact, if you just took all the primes up through y, it's about y over log y of this. And then take all the primes up through y again, about y over log y, and multiply them together. You get about y squared over the square of log y divided by 2 for ordering. So that's already on the scale of y squared. And in fact, if you look at not just products of two primes, but products of lots of primes, you can pretty easily convince yourself that, yes, the chance is about 30% that an integer up through y squared is y smooth. For those of you who care about theorems, uh, <coughs> you can actually very easily prove that it is 1 minus log 2 as y goes to infinity. The chance of the uniform random integer between 1 and y squared is a uh, y squared. And similarly, if you look at, instead of y squared, look at y to the 10th, in other words, n. If you take a uniform random integer up to n, well, suppose you multiply together 10 primes up through y. There's something like y to the 10th ways to do that. And those will give you, well, y to the 10th over 10 factorial, and there's log factors. But it's something on the scale of y to the 10th, something on the scale of n different y smooth numbers up through n. And in fact, if you calculate more precisely, or just try some big n's and uh, see what happens on the computer, then you can see that about 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11, OK, I've written down there the limiting ratio as n goes to infinity is approximately 2.77 times 10 to the minus 11. And again, that's not too hard to prove that there is a limiting ratio and it's approximately a certain thing, which you can calculate and get about 2.77 times 10 to the minus 11. So the integer n plus i, OK, maybe it's a little bit bigger than n, but basically random integers up to n have about a uh, 10 to the minus 11 chance of being smooth. If i and n plus i were independent, which they're not. But if they were independent, then you could just multiply these smoothness probabilities to get the chance that i times n plus i is smooth. At this point, we've left the realm of what could possibly be proven. And worse than that, you might object that i and n plus i are not independent. If i is, for instance, divisible by 2, then n plus i is definitely not divisible by 2. And well, if n plus i is not divisible by 2, it has a little less chance of being smooth. But that effect is minor. and uh, it is at least an experimental fact that i times n plus i and the generalizations of it that I'll talk about later have the smoothness probabilities, at least asymptotically, that you would expect. In this case, 30% uh, times 2.77 times 10 to the minus 11, about an 8 times 10 to the minus 12 chance that i times n plus i is y smooth. Assuming, again, y is about n to the 1 tenth. So to summarize, if you look at the integers between 1 and y squared, then conjecturally you find about y squared over 10 to the uh, 11 fully factored congruences, y smooth congruences. Well, that number is bigger than y over log y. It grows faster than y over log y as y goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity. So if n is big enough, say n bigger than 2 to the 340, then this number of fully factored congruences, the number of y smooth congruences, this 8.5 times 10 to the minus 12 y squared, that is going to be calculate it bigger than 3y over log y. And as n gets bigger, the ratio gets bigger. This is actually overkill to have y this big. I'll come back to that point. If n is bigger than 2 to the 340, which is still a reasonable size number to find a factor, uh, and y is n to the 1 tenth, then presumably, and in experiments, conjecturally, 
the Q sieve will have enough fully factored congruences to succeed in finding a square. With just a tiny bit more effort, generating a few more Y smooth congruences and feeding them to linear algebra, you end up with 10, 100, 1,000 uh, linearly independent squares. Well, linearly independent elements of the kernel matrix, I said, and those give you independent squares, independent chances to factor n, which, again, we can't prove anything, but it seems that we succeed in factoring every number n after a fairly small number of uh, GCD tests. If the GCD of the first square that you write down happens to be 1, then, well, as the slide says, you move on to the next square. So this algorithm seems to always work. There's no theorems. There might be some exceptional integers n that are immune to this algorithm, but nobody's been able to find any. Apparently, the q sieve scales pretty well, better than trial division. What if instead of n to the 1 10th, you try n to the 1 20th, n to 1 30th? Well, you can go through exactly the same analysis, and for any particular u, you can easily see that the chance of n being n to the 1 over u smooth is approaching some constant as a function of u. For a fixed u, it's approaching some constant as n goes to infinity, and that constant is about u to the minus u. So, assuming that it's very close to u to the minus u, one can reasonably conjecture that once y is bigger than about u to the u, in other words, once n is bigger than about u to the u squared, one can reasonably conjecture that the q sieve will work. A more precise statement, the usual conjecture about this type of algorithm is that there's some function, which is in the set of functions u to the 1 plus little of 1 u squared, there's some function in there so that if n is bigger than that, then the q sieve will work with y being about n to the 1 over u. A little of 1 is as u goes to infinity. All right, looking at that n versus u to the u squared, you can figure out what u should be. Instead of having u constant and saying, well, as n gets bigger, the algorithm should get closer and closer to working, you can say, OK, let's figure out what the smallest y should be, where the algorithm works. Let's just have the algorithm compute the smallest y where it works by uh, trying y's. Try y equals 2, y equals 4, y equals 8, y equals 16. And eventually, the q sieve will succeed. It appears and it's reasonable from the n versus u to the u squared formula, if you invert that and you say, what should u look like as a function of n? What should y look like as a function of n? It appears that the y you end up with is about e to the square root of 1 half log n log log. Staring at that formula for a moment, the log of y, the number of digits in y, is something like half log n, sorry, square root of half log n log log. So the number of digits in y, let me just simplify that to square root of log n. The number of digits in y is about the square root of the number of digits in n. The work here, which is some power of y, that's also going to look like something times the square root of log n. Something small times square root of log n. Versus if you did trial division and you divided by all numbers up to uh, n to the 1 half or use more sophisticated methods, you're going to have some power of n as the total amount of work. In other words, taking logs of that, the, um, the number of digits in the time that you spend, comparable to the log of y here, instead of being square root of log n, is going to be some fraction of log n. Once n is big enough, the square root is a lot smaller than any fraction of it. This is a sub-exponential time algorithm that conjecturally works for factoring any integer n into its prime power divisors. Of course, you can once you have prime powers, then you can easily uh, figure out the primes and divide those by just computing square roots, cube roots, etc. All right. So this is the Q sieve. I've said how many integers do you need. I've chosen y. I've been analyzing how big does y have to be for there to be a square. But if you actually want to minimize the cost of the algorithm, it might be better to choose y differently. You might choose y instead of e to the square root 1 half log n log log n. The 1 half you might replace by 1 over 2c, where c is different from 1. And in that case, if you do that, and you work through the same u to the minus u formula, plugging in this y, u being log n over log y, uh, if you work out what u to the u is, it's roughly y to the minus c. 
there's about a 1 over y to the c chance of an integer on the scale of n being smooth. And conjecturally, the special integers like i times n plus i have about the same probability of being smooth. Uh, if y is this complicated formula, e to the square root 1 over 2c, et cetera. So if that's the smoothness chance, then instead of looking at, before it was 1 over y, it was the smoothness chance. We looked at y squared numbers to find y smooth numbers. If the smoothness chance is 1 over y to the c, then suppose c is bigger than 1, say c is 2. 1 over y squared smoothness chance means you have to look at y cubed numbers to find enough smooth numbers. In general, it seems that the number of i's you have to look at for y chosen in this way is about y to the c plus 1. Reasonable conjecture is that the exponent is asymptotically c plus 1. The log of the number of i's divided by the log of y converges to c plus 1 for any fixed c. In other words, taking a lot of the c plus 1 power, you can uh, put that inside the exponential, get e to the square root of c plus 1 squared over 2c log n log log n, which is, of course, minimized for c equals 1, ignoring the effect of the little o of 1. If you make c bigger than you might bigger than 1, then you might make the algorithm less expensive. Because linear algebra might be more expensive than uh, finding the fully factored congruences in the first place. Finding the y smooth numbers, i times n plus i, could be a negligible part of the algorithm. Linear algebra, which has cost just depending on y, something like y squared or y cubed, the cost of linear algebra could be dominating the cost of the computation. If that ever happens, then you've chosen y bet. You should choose y to have uh, y to be smaller, so c should be bigger, to reduce the cost of linear algebra. Linear algebra on the y by y matrix. Remember, there's something like y over log y. Let's just call that y primes, less than or equal to y. And the number of vectors that you need to guarantee that there will be a square, non-trivial square, is something like y again. The cost of doing linear algebra on a, on a y by y matrix, y vectors each of length y, is something like y squared y cubed. I'll get back to that in more detail. Um, if that cost is dominating the cost of your algorithm, then you can reduce that cost by reducing y. In other words, by increasing c past 1. Once you have the time for finding the smooth congruences being in balance with the time for linear algebra, then it's no longer a good idea to reduce c. And it might be that linear algebra never dominates the cost anyway. But this is an option to keep in mind if linear algebra is expensive, as, for reasons I'll explain, it is in practice. All right. There are several directions to go at this point. I should maybe look ahead for a moment to the next talk, where I'll talk about how do you do the smoothness detection. How do you figure out which of the numbers i and n plus i are smooth? And well, the answer might simply be to sieve, as the name of the Q sieve might suggest. But that is not actually what people do. I'll be saying a whole lot about what people actually do in the second talk. Um, I'll also be improving the choice of uh, congruences. Instead of i times n plus i, we're going to see a lot of better alternatives to that. The Q sieve is the number field sieve for the number field being Q. And well, in general, the number field is i. Uh, adjusted depending on n, and then varied. There are a lot of choices for any n. I'll talk about that in a lot of detail. There's one thing you can do without really changing the i times n plus i, which is choose better i's. Let me start with a motivating problem here, which is that if you look at bigger and bigger i's, the chance of i times n plus i being smooth goes down somewhat. Do experiments, or just think about it for a moment. You can see that if i is about y squared, the biggest i's, then the chance of smoothness is smaller than it was for the smallest i, say i being about y. A crude analysis in the middle of this slide says, well, the reason for that is that as i gets bigger, i times n plus i gets bigger. So its smoothness chance goes down. As you have bigger and bigger numbers, the smoothness chance drops, as illustrated by, for instance, the y squared versus y to the 10th, a number up to y to the 10th has a much smaller smoothness chance. Here, the difference is not so severe. But still, as i times n plus i grows from something like n up to something like y squared n, surely the smoothness chance should drop. You can work out with the u to the minus u formula how much it should drop. If you look more carefully at the i times n plus i, then you say, well, OK, it's not so simple. You can't just look at the uh, size of i times n plus i. You have to look separately at the factors i and n plus i, because n plus i always has about the same smoothness chance. It's always about the same size. It's always about n, no matter what i is. But i becomes less and less likely to be smooth. 
If i is less than or equal to y, then certainly it's y smooth. If i is about y squared, then I said before, it has about 1 minus log 2 chance of being y squared. This doesn't seem like a big drop, but as we generalize from i times n plus i, we'll see bigger effects from i, this loss of smoothness chance. So a question you can ask, even without worrying about how much of the drop this is, is can you do better? Can you find i's where the chance of i times n plus i being smooth is increased? Can you avoid this loss of performance, this degradation of smoothness chance as i increases? The answer is yes, if you generalize your notion of smoothness just a little bit in a way that is completely harmless. Supposing you choose a number q, which is the square of a big prime, say bigger than y, could be a little bigger or a lot bigger than y. And suppose you choose i's so that n plus i is divisible by q. Just some arithmetic progression of i's. Or in general, you form a q sublattice of the i's in the number field sieve more generally will see pairs i comma j, which look like j n plus i, and we'll look at sublattices of the lattice of i comma j. In this special case, these sublattices are, you could say i is divisible by q, but more productive is say that n plus i is divisible by q. Choose your i's so that n plus i is divisible by this pre-chosen q, which is the square of a prime. In other words, choose i to be q minus n mod q, or add q to that, or add another q to that, et cetera. Arithmetic progression of distance. For each i of that form, instead of hoping for n plus i to be as smooth as a random number, you can say, wait a minute, n plus i, by construction, being divisible by q, it should have the same smoothness times q chance as a number about as big as n over q. q is not smooth, assuming it's a square of a prime bigger than y, but it doesn't matter. It's OK. for You don't have to add whatever that big prime is, the square root of q. You don't have to stick that into your exponent vectors because it's showing up to the second power. We're perfectly happy to have squares in n plus i. You can just forget about the primes involved in those squares. And i times n plus i divided by q, well, that having a q forced into it uh, has a better smoothness chance than something which is just i times n plus i for i being that was big. Of course, i has to be chosen larger to be in this arithmetic progression instead of being 1, 2, 3, et cetera. I'm writing down numbers i that are on the scale of q, 2q, 3q. But, uh, well, we'll come back to how effective this is in just a moment. This is something you can do to find some i's, which at least have a different flavor of the chance of their being smooth by generalizing the smoothness to allow a, an extra q, which is a square of a prime in there. That's fine. You can vary q instead of, for instance, taking y squared values of i. You could take y choices of q, and for each one, take y choices of i. And, well, as long as your q's are not very small, those i's are not going to bump into each other. So you'll have about y squared chances of smoothness. The last minute I tossed in an example here, which is, suppose you're trying to factor, I asked my computer for a random number, and it told me 314159365897933. Some of you might think that my random number generator is broken, but I think it just got lucky. Anyway, this number is not prime. It's also not so easy to factor. Those of you who factored 671 and 611 in your heads, I don't expect you to look at this number and factor it in your head. Uh, you could try factoring it with the Q-Civ. Not such a bad method although we'll certainly see better methods. The original Q-Civ, if you like, with the little Q on the left here being 1, uh, writes down i and n plus i when i is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And, well, you can see how big i is, 1, 2, 3. All of those are certainly y smooth, no matter what y I'm going to choose, at least 3. Uh, n plus i is then a big long number, which has whatever chance of being y smooth. Suppose I instead choose i to be uh, 802458 plus 997 squared times an integer. I've written down the first few i's in the left column here, 802458, and then plus 997 squared, plus another 997 squared. If you write down n plus i for those and divide by the 997 squared that you know is in there because I computed the 802458 appropriately, uh, by dividing it by 997 squared, taking the remainder and subtracting it from q, q being 997 squared, then you see these smaller numbers. Instead of hoping for the original 1 and n plus 1, 2 and n plus 2, and so on, to be smooth, we are hoping for 802458 and n plus that over 997 squared to be smooth. So that's an example of using sublattices. How effective is this? Does this deal with the problem of 
i and n plus i together having a smaller smoothness chance as i grows? The answer is yes. In fact, it's even better than dealing with the problem. The crude analysis says that, yes, if you just take, uh, say, y squared values of q, and for each one, take one value of i, namely uh, q minus n mod q, and consider the i times n plus i over q, then that's something about as big as n at worst, and on average, something like n over 2. It's never getting bigger than, uh, than n, the way that y squared times n plus y squared was noticeably bigger than n. So as you vary q, you have a whole supply of numbers here, all of which you can check for y smoothness. And they should all have about the same chance of y smoothness as random numbers between 0 and n. There's no degradation as you look at more and more of these numbers, unless you look at an insane number of q's, which for sufficiently large n, you never do. If you look more carefully at the two factors here, then you see that because they're better balanced, instead of hoping for 1 and n plus 1 to be smooth, we're hoping for something on the scale of q and something on the scale of n over q to be smooth. And that actually has a better chance of happening than, something, than the original method with q equals 1. If you chose, for instance, q being about the square root of n, then how big is i? Well, it's something like the square root of n. And n over q, n plus i over q, are also about the square root of n. And then uh, square root of n in terms of the, assume that y is n to the 1 over u, instead of looking for a number like y to the u to be smooth, we're looking for two numbers, i and n plus i over q, both on the scale of y to the u over 2, looking for both of those to be y smooth. The chance of that, well, if you believe the u to the u formula, the chance of a number up to y to the u over 2 being y smooth is something like u over 2 to the minus u over 2. And then there are two of those numbers. You would reasonably conjecture that the chance of both of those being smooth is about the square of u over 2 to the minus u over 2. Compared to the u to the u before, u to the minus u before, the smoothness chance is increased by a factor of 2 to the u, speeding up the whole algorithm by some comparable factor. If you readjust y to uh, account for this, the final speed up is not going to look like exactly 2 to the u, but it's certainly a non-constant speed up for looking uh, in terms of the number of i's you have to look at uh, for finding enough smooth congruences. Again, with this generalization of a congruence to allow division by q. All right. In my third talk, I'm going to generalize all of this to the number field SIF. An intermediate step, which I'll spend very little time on, is the quadratic SIF. Both of these change the i times n plus i into other polynomials in i. Or, as I said before, there will be another variable j, and we'll have a uh, homogeneous polynomial in i and j. Uh, instead of i times j n plus i, you might look at, for instance, uh, i squared minus n j squared. <coughs> well, let's just take j equals 1. Now we're looking at i squared minus n. If i is about the square root of n, then i squared minus n is also about the square root of n. And that makes the i squared minus n's considered in the quadratic sieve substantially smaller than the uh, n plus 1, n plus 2, et cetera, considered in the q sieve. The quadratic sieve writes down these numbers that have the same purpose algebraically as the i times n plus i. You can replace that by i squared minus n, and it has all the same uh, role. You mechanically write down the same algorithm, and it seems to work for every n, except it has this wonderful advantage of the i's that you look at. Uh, the i squared minus n's, the congruences that you want to have being smooth, are a lot smaller. Even better than having two numbers that are like y to the u over 2, this is like having one number that's uh, y to the u over 2 that we want to have being smooth. While people relabel u in this case to reflect the drop from n to square root of n, i squared minus n is much, much smaller than n if i is close to the square root of n. The multiple polynomial quadratic sieve does even better by combining these two ideas. It takes the i squared minus n and divides it by q. It finds i's in an arithmetic progression where i squared minus n is divisible by q. You've heard about this problem before of computing square roots mod q. That's how do you find, for a given q, say prime or square root of prime, how do you find the i's, the arithmetic progression of i's mod q, such that i squared minus n is divisible by q? Well, that is computing square roots mod a prime, which is sufficiently easy that I'm not sure I will actually spend any time on it. It's a very fast computation. It's something that takes a bit of programming, but it's, it's very fast to figure out the i's for which i squared minus n is divisible by q. 
The multiple polynomial quadratic sieve does not really dramatically reduce the uh, n to the one half size of numbers that we want to have being smooth in the quadratic sieve. Just like if you look at the uh, one over u to the u versus two to the u over u to the u, those are not the same, but they're on the same scale. The number field sieve is on a whole nother scale. The number field sieve has generalizations of i times n plus i, where the size of the numbers, the size of those generalized congruences, is, instead of being n or square root of n, is n to the epsilon. It's n to the little o of 1, something that the exponent goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So that's going to be the topic of my third uh, lecture, is the number field sieve, how we make that work with, instead of i times n plus i, write down appropriate number field generalizations. If you like, you can look at the quadratic sieve as doing the same thing with the, uh, instead of i times n plus i, it's i plus square root of n times i minus square root of n. The number field sieve has the same flavor with higher degree number fields. Um, but okay, I'll come back to that in my third talk. The last thing I wanted to do today, in the eight minutes I believe I've left, is tell you how linear algebra can be done at high speed. And then again, in the next talk, I'll come back to how do we find the smooth congruences. The problem here, all right, we're trying to find a linear dependency between vectors. We're trying to find a single vector, if you like, that if you dot it with a bunch of vectors, you'd get zero. In a non-trivial way, you're not allowed to just write down zero. Well, in general, let's say that we're trying to solve linear equation. Let's suppose we have a y by y matrix. OK, it's smaller than that and maybe not square, but basically the same problem. We have a y by y matrix over F2. M is a linear map from F2 to the y to F2 to the y. The problem of solving linear equations, which is a slight generalization of what we actually want, is you're given some vector of length y over F2. And you want to find some vector v, such that m times v is your input. The input is w. <coughs> you want to find v so that m times v, m applied to v, is w. If we can solve this problem, and we can, and I'll tell you basically the best algorithm that we know for doing this, then we can find random elements of the kernel. Finding some element of the kernel is easy. You could, you could apply that algorithm mechanically to w equals 0. Solve m times v equals 0. But all the best algorithms we have will simply tell you, I know, v is 0. And that's not what we want. What we want is random elements of the kernel. And the trick to do that is start with a random vector, r. Apply the matrix, apply the linear transformation, m, to that r to compute w. Then feed w to your algorithm, which doesn't know what r was. It just knows w. Feed that w to your algorithm to find a v so that m times v equals w. And now the difference between v and r is going to be a uniform random element of the kernel. The role of algorithms here is maybe kind of artificial, really, I'm just saying if there's a function that gives you v given w, or it could be a probabilistic function, that function then applied to m times r will give you something that's r plus a random element of the kernel. So this will let us generate random dependencies between vectors, random linear relations between vectors, and therefore random squares, which is exactly what we need in the q sieve and other congruence combination algorithms. In integer factorization, well, there's lots of problems in mathematics where doing the computations at all, even proving there exists an algorithm to do your computations, is hard. This is not one of those situations. What's interesting about this subject is how quickly we can do the computations. And in particular, for linear algebra, everything I'm going to tell you in my last few slides is just speeding up linear algebra from y cubed to y squared. Gaussian elimination is going to solve your system of y linear equations and y variables, it's going to solve that in time about y cubed. Maybe faster, but in practice for the kinds of equations that we write down, it's about y cubed. The better methods that we have, Wiedemann's method, not to be confused with Wiedemann. Uh, Wiedemann turns out to be uh, American, totally changing the pronunciation of his name. Anyway, Wiedemann's method of series denominators, which I'll tell you, instead of taking y cubed time, takes y squared time. There's a few other methods, but I think this one's the easiest to understand. Uh, a few other methods that have y squared kind of performance. This is assuming that the equations you're trying to solve, that the matrix you're trying, the linear transformation you're trying to invert, is easy to evaluate. It's sparse. It has very few non-zero entries. Or more generally, we can apply m to a vector in only about y operations. If you think about how many entries there are in a vector in the context of the Q-sieve, 
Sorry? You can evaluate m. m is a function. Well, yes, I mean, you can compute mv given v, which I say as you can compute m. Yes, uh, you can evaluate mv given v using about y operations. And that's certainly the case for the QCIF because each vector that you write down, every row or column, whichever way you write the matrix, uh, is going to have only a few entries in it because the vector, oh, only a few non-zero entries in it. Those vectors are factorizations of numbers that are not very big compared to y. All right, so this does speed things up from y cubed to y squared. And how does it work? How do series denominators invert a matrix? Well, let's look at the vectors w and mw and m squared w and m cubed w and so on. Eventually, these all being vectors inside a y-dimensional vector space, they're going to have some linear dependency, some linear relation. Let's suppose that there's a relation of degree y. Well, that's as far as you have to go to guarantee that there's going to be a relation. P0, W plus P1, MW plus etc. All the way up through Py, M to the YW. Let's say that's equal to 0. I'm going to assume that the first term there is W, that P0 is equal to 1. I'll leave as an exercise what you do if P0 is equal to 0. And assuming that P0 is equal to 1, you end up with W is equal to minus P1 MW, of course, ignore the minus for characteristic 2 if you like, uh, minus, etc., minus PY into the YW. In other words, W has been written just by the uh, existence of these P's. Assuming we knew what the P's were, we've written W as M times something. The something, the V, the output of the algorithm being minus P1W minus, etc., minus PY M to the Y minus 1. To get a handle on these p's, to figure out what the p's are, the trick in the series denominators method is to write down the following power series with vector coefficients, w as the coefficient of t to the 0, t being the series variable, plus mw times t, plus m squared w times t squared, plus etc. Notice that if you multiply that power series by the polynomial that we're trying to find, well, I've written it as p0t to the y plus p1t to the y minus 1 plus etc. plus pyt to the 0, multiplying the series by that produces a polynomial of degree less than y. If you calculate, for instance, let's just calculate the coefficient of t to the y in the product of the polynomial, well, this polynomial, third line from the bottom, and the series here, fifth line from the bottom, the coefficient of t to the y is, let's see, there's a p0 t to the y w, so p0 w, plus there's a p1 t to the y minus 1 mw t, so that's p1 mw plus et cetera, and you see that's exactly what's equal to 0. And if you do the same computation of the coefficient of t to the y plus 1, then you just get m times the same thing. It's also 0. So this series is rational. It's a polynomial with vector coefficients divided by a polynomial with f2 coefficients. We can compute the numerator and denominator to save time. The, the vectors here are kind of big. You don't need to work with the vectors. So what everybody does, what we have suggested, is uh, projecting from f2 to the y, projecting randomly down to f2. So you can choose some random linear map r from vectors to f2. Or it doesn't even have to be really random. Just take the first coordinate or some random coordinate of vectors. But to prove something, take a, a random linear map r from f2 to the y to f2. Then, well, applying R to this equation that the series is equal to polynomial divided by polynomial, you end up with the same kind of equation involving uh, bits as coefficients. That the series R of W, which is just one bit, plus R of MW, so that's apply the matrix M to your vector W, feed it through this linear map R, and then multiply it by your series variable T, plus etc. That series has a denominator which divides what we're looking for, divides the polynomial that will let us invert the matrix. It's easy to compute series denominators. That's just a, an extended GCD computation, a continued fraction computation. You do that with Euclid's algorithm, or some people call a simple case of that the burlikant massey algorithm. There's faster algorithms out there. But that's good enough here that you can compute the denominator of a power series, if you know how big the, de the denominator can be, as we do in this case. You can compute the denominator from the first well, double as many coefficients as the degree of your denominator using continued fractions. And well, that might, the denominator of the series might not be exactly p0t to the y plus et cetera. It's just some divisor of it. But if you compute a few 
denominators in this way using a few random choices of R. And actually, you can merge the works, and they take only about as long as one R. If you compute the denominators of a few series and take the least common multiples of those, then you will end up with, aside from irrelevant powers of t, you will end up with the desired polynomial with pretty good probability. Uh, even two random r's is, I believe, good enough. Three is certainly good enough. And the probability grows as you look at more and more r's. Again, the work doesn't go up very much as r increases. All right, so that's fast linear algebra. That takes only about y squared bit operations to uh, compute the kernel of a y by y matrix. Next time in my second talk, I will tell you about how expensive it is by all sorts of fun methods, like the elliptic curve method, to find the y smooth congruences in the first place before getting down to linear algebra. Thank you for your attention.